cyber intelligence, the new ish frontier. Um, a couple quick housekeeping announcements. Um, on behalf of the Diana Initiative, I'd like to express gratitude for our diamond, platinum, and gold sponsors, which is MongoDB, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, Amazon Information Security, eLearn Security, Intel, and Remediant. And also just a quick reminder, um, please make sure to go to our closing keynote today at 4 p.m., um, which is 4 p.m. PST, sorry, on stage number one, um, and join us in the networking area afterwards. Today's session is live, uh, and the recording will be made available. We may have time for an open Q&A at the end, so please keep questions in mind. And I would like to welcome Yasmin, AKA Yaz. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank everyone for coming. Um, so as the title implies, I'm a hunter. And through this talk, we're gonna discover what that means and what I do. So yeah, if my mouse works, that is. There we go. So disclaimer, like others have done, uh, these are my own views and opinions based on experience, and I don't represent anybody today. So let's get into why everybody hopefully came, and hopefully y'all are here to learn more about threat hunting. If not, then oops. But hopefully you'll walk away with a better understanding of threat hunters and threat hunting, which includes common types of hunters, what a threat hunter could add to incident response and prevention, skills a seasoned hunter might have and how they might help, common tools that hunters use, a method to our madness, why organizations should care about their threat space, and I'll give everyone some helpful learning tools and aids in the end, just in case y'all are interested. So first I'm gonna do a small bio. Um, been tinkering around with web page uh, vulnerabilities since I was like around 17. Uh, I started infecting my own systems with malware and spyware, just kind of see what happens. Um, but I was young, I didn't think that those were actually real jobs that you could do. I didn't think you could make money from that kind of stuff. So I did what any normal teenager does and I joined the military and I joined as a signals and intelligence analyst. Yeah, I stayed in there from like 2003 to 2018. Uh, did some targeting downrange, then came back. Um, I am now at Fidelis as their senior threat researcher. Um, so as you can kind of tell, uh, my career grew up in the shadows of digital conversations. I love hunting, this is what I do. It's the bee's knees for me. <laughs> Discovery of the unknown while I'm staying unknown is lots of fun. Um, I had to learn weaknesses in my targets and how to exploit them. And sometimes, you know, during my career, I would spend so much time tracking my targets that I would know them better than my family, unfortunately. Um, I was trained to become an expert in the area that I was assigned, even as a contractor for Department of Defense I was still sitting in the shadows and a target is a target and I had, had better had my facts straight because sometimes people's lives were depending on my ability to put that, you know, puzzle piece together and get these threats right. A network is a network, human or digital, in the shadows it's all, it's all the same. So a little bit um, about my work life. I... I used to uh, track Man one from their use of macros and their deployment of Hansator. Um, I tracked targets that were really bad with OPSEC. And sometimes I would have too much information and I'd have to leave it out for my team. And sometimes uh, I would find new actors and you know try to figure out who they are and what they're doing. So, we're going to get in a little bit more into those examples of, you know, things I've done in my career. And we're going to start with macros. Um, <laughs> something that people tend to notice about me, especially if I'm working on a malicious Word document, is that I find macros to be a lot of fun. 
and MAN1 was no exception with their use of macros in deploying Hansator. Um, Hansator is a downloader that it aims to put secondary malware on a victim system. And I would start by looking at API calls to get an idea of where things might be hiding. And you can hopefully see, I'm not too sure how small it is, but in this picture, you can see that this macro is checking to see what kind of operating system you're on. And you can also see that it'll probably be freeing up some space to possibly move code around via kernel through uh, kernel 32 virtual OLEC, which is an API call. So if we were taking this malware apart, we would locate that API call, we would put a breakpoint there and we would go check it out. Yeah, this was like a really fun macro for me to take apart. It used XOR, uh, XOR to hide the payload. It hollowed out some space in running Explore EXE and then it injected the payload into the running process. Uh, it used a string, like a little Easter egg, uh, P-O-L-A, Bola, as a marker in the binary, and this would tell us where the malicious binary was going to be sitting before it was actually injected into, uh, into the running process. So little things like that for me were just exciting, like the little Easter eggs and watching it move code around and then going and carving out the payload before the payload is actually injected. Yeah, uh, spent a lot of time doing that, a little fun. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's move on to talking about some OPSEC fails because I could talk about this macro all day long. Just kidding, we're gonna, we're gonna do a, a couple bonus slides here. All right, so this next, these next two slides are gonna be just a couple extra examples. Um, this first one is a, a hunt that I was on and it started out by me checking low-level alerts that might be a false positive, and I stumbled upon this little odd get request. And I was like, okay, are they scanning us? What are they doing? Um, you know, what's their goal here? Why am I seeing this low-level alert? So I went to our PCAP system and I looked up the information so that I could pull it all down and have the full conversation. Because when I started this hunt, I was just in a, like an endpoint uh, logging system. So I only had like a little, a little blurb of the alert and I needed the whole conversation to get a better idea. So I went and pulled that uh, down from our PCAP system. And I saw that right after the get request was this post request. And it was like right after, so this person was scanning us, they were sending their stuff, they were just all the things all at once. <laughs> but they weren't done. It gets a little bit better. So this is just an example of what the alert looked like in Splunk. So if you have uh, Splunk hooked up to your endpoint systems, or you know you have your data going in, this might be what you see if you get the alert as well. So you can see that the post uh, path is put in there. Let's see if I can get my mouse over there. So right here, that's the bad stuff that was happening. All right. So in this attempt, they just kept going. They kept trying to you know, push everything all at once, like I mentioned, like all the things, do it all. And they ended up trying to upload a back door. Um, they didn't wait around to see if they were getting an error response because if they had, you know, at least checked, they'd see that nothing was going through, but they didn't. So they tried to upload a backdoor to us uh, and we were able to, you know, get the backdoor, analyze it and whatnot. Uh, they didn't get anywhere. I just wrote up an intrusion attempt uh, report there and kind of moved on. This was like one incident out of many where this attacker kept trying the exact same uh, intrusion attempt. So they didn't not just fail once, they failed a couple times. So as a hunter, that's like some of the fun stuff you can see. All right, this is uh, an example of CoinHive. Uh, again, I was looking through low level alerts. And so that was like something I did every day at uh, this position. I would come in in the morning, I would get on to and all the uh, endpoint system, all the log systems that we had, and I would go through low-level alerts, make sure that we didn't have any uh, false positives or 
you know, anything that really needed attention um, that we might have not missed or might have not picked up with or because it was marked as low, it wasn't given the right attention anyways. So that was just like a morning routine going through these things. All right. So I noticed this alert for the possible uh, crypto miner infection and I went and checked out the traffic again, but it was not a crypto, uh, it was not an infection, crypto miner infection on a system. Uh, when I checked the traffic, I saw coin high fingerprints. So I was just like, oh, this is crypto hijacking and not a crypto infection. So the crypto mining code that CoinHive uses was placed on the website. And when the user clicked that site, they, are, they were unknowingly helping to mine for coins while they were visiting. But once you leave the site, you're no longer helping. So there's not much I can do. This was just an annoyance alert and not really anything, anything to uh, dig into. So it is still out there, still being annoying. I thought it was down for a little while because I was seeing less reports on the activity, but nope, CoinHive is still out there. And this is an example of CoinHive and Splunk. So if you were going through alerts in Splunk, this is something you might see. And you can see that <laughs> the path clearly says CoinHive. It says it's a JavaScript miner, it's Trojan. So yeah, just an example of the alert. All right, really, let's move on to OPSEC fails. There's no better OPSEC fail mention than Hidden Cobra. If you uh, have ever done research on Hidden Cobra or North Korea, you'll know that uh, they tend to have some good OPSEC fails. In fact, I think another uh, threat intelligence analyst has made a whole PowerPoint presentation on nothing but North Korea OPSEC fails. So if you ever get bored and you want to go through those, look that up. All right. So this is just a small chart I put together on hitting Cobra during an analysis period um, that I had. Uh, just a small one. <laughs> As you can see, there's a lot of things here, a lot of things going on. Uh, so Hidden Cobra was kind of easy for me to track just because they, they're they known for like reusing code. They're known for just changing little bits and pieces and exploits and reusing exploits. They're known for leaving passwords in their malware. They're known for using Google Drive. They're known for leaving their Google Drive open. They're known for leaving passwords to that Google Drive uh, in their malware. They also have been known to leave like test files in Google Drive that is, you know, they're just like, oh, does, does this malware actually work? Or, you know, <laughs> here's some victim information we're just gonna leave out there in the open. Um, yeah, so it's pretty, pretty entertaining if you're a threat intelligence analyst going after uh, hitting Cobra. They also have a unique operating system called Red Star and so sometimes if you are monitoring your network logs, you might see a operating system called Red Star pinging, you know, pinging you and scanning you, and that's North Korea. They don't really try to hide it. It's right out there in the open. Yeah, I like North Korea. They're one of my faves. All right, so sometimes as a cyber threat intelligence analyst, as a hunter, um, you will have too much information. It's just what happens. Um, you have like so much and you need something to do with it. So one thing that I used to do at one of the places I worked is we had a SharePoint um, area and I would create like little SharePoint areas, uh, pages for my coworkers on information I thought was interesting but didn't have time to get to. And so this is just one example. And I had found an information stealer. The code looked very similar to Hawkeye, but I wasn't 100% sure. So I just tried to you know, leave as much detail as I can um, without getting too into it. And you know, hopefully I would have a coworker come back and pick it up if they thought it was interesting as well. So I also use a OneNote. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, Lots of tabs you can use, and then in the tabs, more tabs, and then you create as many notebooks as you want to. Um, so I'm a hoarder of notebooks and tabs in OneNote, um, and it's easy to share with other analysts. So if I create a tab and I think, 
you know, some other analyst needs this information, I can, you know, easily share that over. And if you use Teams, it can be integrated with Teams and even easier for sharing and keeping notes. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to get into talking more about hunters and their roles after you've seen some examples of hunts that I was on and you've seen a little bit of like my experience kind of summarized into a couple slides. We're going to talk about two common types of threat hunters and I acknowledge that there might be hybrids of these roles or different, uh, you know, different and more variants of these roles here. So this is just big overview and based on experience. So the first type of hunter are those who hunt in endpoint management systems, Windows, uh, Windows event logs, and large data collection systems. And these hunters typically sit in incident response teams on SOX. They are looking for things that might have been missed. They are looking for known IOCs, indicators of compromise. They are looking for patterns that might indicate a possible intrusion or infection. Sometimes they might be looking for something they have recently heard about or read about, um, you know, because they're hunters, so they're staying in the know. So they might have saw something on Twitter about a new ransomware or a new CVE or something along those lines, and they want to go check to make sure that their company is uh, not affected or hopefully not affected. These hunters might also use that data to create signatures like Yara's, Snore, Sericata, um, and other types of, you know, signatures to help beef up their company's uh, security. These hunters can also help provide actionable intelligence when an incident happens. So let's say an incident goes down, there's a malware infection on somebody's computer. These hunters are able to know about that, you know, uh, malware, they're able to stay in the know, so they can help provide incident response with, hey, this is where you should look. This is the data that might have been exfiltrated. This is my recommendations on how you know, we might help it or end, uh, prevent it in the future. So the next type of researcher are those that are not sitting in IR, threat researchers. These researchers, like I mentioned, are probably not in IR or in a SOC, and they're more likely to be found at a cybersecurity company, at a government agency, and of course, maybe in military. Uh, some of these researchers might be assigned an area of operation or a threat space. Uh, they might also be researching based on organizational needs or researching based on their own interest. So some commonalities that uh, these analysts have. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to double click. <laughs> Both these researchers are hunting uh, threats based on <clears throat> Both these researchers are hunting threats based on gathered open source intelligence. And some, some of these research researchers might have client data, they might have logs and point systems, they might have uh, big data. You know, if they're in government areas, they're probably gonna have a lot more uh, data than, you know, if you're at a, in IR or if you're like sitting in a cybersecurity company. So the types of data and the amount of data is, might be different but they'll still have lots of data to go through. Uh, they're, both, they're both probably tracking malware evolution, APTs, TTPs, and new CVEs so that they can stay in the know. These are all things that common you know, hunters do. And of course, both types of hunters and all hunters know that even a little vulner vulnerability can be a dangerous thing. All right, these hunters also know their enemy's weakness. Their knowledge of their threat space gives them the upper hand. So we're gonna talk about a, li a little bit about why this is an important field. Imagine you're planning to go to war and instead of using the data that you have on your enemy, which includes like historical data, patterns of behaviors, co uh, common TTPs, you just throw people at it. Well, this didn't work well for the mother of dragons. We know how that ended and it doesn't work well for cyber threats. Her poor planning did nothing to stop the White Walkers. It was one person who understood the weakness of their enemy that was able to take down the threat, Arya. Arya essentially killed the chain of attack. 
She was a skilled hunter who understood and knew her threat space. And when dealing with many threats of all shapes and sizes, there's no one piece of software or magic button that's going to just take care of it all. Being reactive instead of proactive can cost people time and money and data. So you might wonder, what does a hunter add to IR and prevention? Like I mentioned, a hunter is proactive. They're aiming to understand their threat space so well that they are staying one step ahead. They are considered breakers of chains. Having someone who understands and knows the changes in malicious campaigns, they know that what the newest ransomware is, new CVEs, they understand how the intrusion chain of attack works and what that looks like. They understand the infection chain malware uses and what that looks like. They understand how to create signatures and they're able to discover undiscovered threats. That will no doubt help you move from being reactive to proactive. You always want to be proactive. All right, now that we're kind of getting a better idea of hunters, what they, what they do, kind of where they fit in, what some of their hunting might look like, let's talk about their skills. This section is just kind of put together from my experiences, my lessons learned. It's not meant to be like, you know, you don't write this down and go buy this. It's not the end all be all. All right. So I think above all, no matter what your hunter has and is bringing to the table, they need to have the ability to adapt. Threats are ever changing. Things are continuously coming out. You have zero days. You have new ransomware, new malware, new, you know, uh, new actors. Things are always evolving in the cyberspace. And so your analyst has to be able to adapt and change as well. Not being able to adapt is, can be costly. All right, we're going to start with uh, malware analysis. Um, I think malware analysis is one of the more basic skills that we have here. Um, and so, yeah, we're just going to start with that. Your analyst needs to understand how malware behaves, both on the system and on the network. They can't hunt what they don't know. And while they might not be, like, code deep or assembly deep, they're still able to gain you know, a lot of information about threat, about the threat, about malware. That's always good. They don't have to be an expert uh, to do malware analysis. This is kind of entry level here. I think it's pretty entry level. Um, and, you know, this might be where some analysts are stepping into cyber intelligence, or they, this might be where an analyst is going into reverse engineering. So I really feel malware analysis is like that foundation. So there's always a chain of events, chain of infection, chain of intrusion, you know, chain of attack, like always a chain of events. And your hunter is going to be able to help break these and understanding that chain of infection, you know, from a malware analysis point of view is very important because you can't help what you don't know. All right. So another skill that's helpful to have, and I mentioned, is reverse engineering. You know, being able to take the things up apart in order to know, like, how they work, um, how to protect against them, whether that is by making better rules or if it's blocking or if it's, you know, taking it apart just to know uh, IOCs. And being able to know those IOCs, indicators of compromise, can help you find other similar files. It can help you find other similar threats or possible infections on the network. And reverse engineering can sometimes lead to Easter eggs. Kind of like I mentioned in my earlier example, the little string marker, Paola, that led us to where the payload was going to be. Those little clues, they help. Um, and they can also help to identify techniques that an attacker use or a malware developer uses. So being able to get into the file deeper is definitely, definitely a good thing and only only furthers things better. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, reverse engineering can help find indicators of compromise. So doing malware analysis, uh, files are often sent to things like sandboxes and whatnot, or uh, you know, auto behavior tools. And those tools might 
might not work. They might not get the IOCs. Your, you know, your piece of malware or what you're working with, it might be aware. And because it's aware, it's not running uh, in the environment like it should. And reverse engineering kind of takes that away and is able to allow the analysts to get things that were missed in behavior analysis and or by running in the sandbox. Yeah. All right. So let's move into the hacker mindset. There's no better way to uh, get into the hacker mindset than becoming one for a little while. You know, even if it's a for, for short time. Uh, CEH courses are a great way to get inside, you know, the head of a hacker. You go through these courses, you learn how to do penetration testing that puts you in the steps, that puts you in the know-how, gets that brain working, thinking, all good things. The analyst uh, also learns networking on a deeper level. So it takes what you learned in malware analysis, bumps it up. It takes what you learned in reverse engineering, bumps it up. It gives you that, you know, attacker mindset of the network and intrusions. And it puts you in the first hand in the driver's seats of being the intruder. They will also learn about exploits and vulnerabilities in the chain of attack. So all the information that you can learn from taking CEH courses will make them make you or make your analysts more prepared to hunt on endpoints and try to uh, track bad actors. And it'll help them understand what a threat actor might go through to infect or attack a victim. So the more you can get inside how hackers do their thing, the more you're able to go and hunt against them. Boop. All right. So network analysis kind of plays off all the other skills. Um, you'll be dealing with a, you know, a lot of different uh, network data. And so you need to be able to know how to learn to read PCAPs. And you need to understand how, you know, network traffic behaves. And you need to know what the conversations look like. You basically <laughs> reading PCAPs. You need, uh, well, you don't need to, but you'll be able to identify abnormalities and patterns. And that's a good thing. And being able to do all that will help you gather intel from those PCAPs. So when you can identify patterns that helps you build TTPs for actors, you're able to you know, search the network a little bit better. You're able to go through your PCAP systems a little bit better. You're able to identify you know, some of that network activity uh, better when you're doing hunting and whatnot. And it gives you a better you know, mind frame for when you're looking at maybe malware or you're trying to find actors, being able to build up that network, um, that network diagram and that network infrastructure. So can't go wrong with understanding and dealing with uh, network analysis. All right, so now that everyone is got a better understanding of what hunters do, some of the skills we have, where we might sit and how we might be utilized, um, this tool section is for those who might be interested in coming into this field and or if people want to know what tools their analysts might need. This is a, a little list I put together. Again, it's based on my experience, not meant to be the you have to have kind of list. So network analysis tools uh, like Wireshark, Network Miner, Threat Miner, uh, Robotex. Some of those are ones you download, some of those are online. Uh, malware analysis tools like P Studio. It's a lot of information in one spot with that tool. It's a really good tool. Uh, PEID, uh, Norbian, Process Explorer, all good malware tools. So some vulnerability analysis tools. These could be things like debuggers, Nmap, and exploit, things that you find on Kali, Burp Suite stuff like that. Link analysis tools. Link analysis is an underrated analysis. Um, analyst Notebook, Palantir, Lucidcharts, Maltigo. Those are all some pretty good ones. I think Analyst Notebook and Palantir are probably the best. But Lucidcharts, Maltigo, also Visio. Those will work too when you don't have the money for the good ones. Some dark web analysis tools can be things such as Tor, uh, not evil search engine, digital shadows, recorded future, tales, um, dark fail. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different dark web tools. And 
uh, what is it? Trace Labs has a good um, good set of tools as well. Not so much dark web, but they have some really good like analysis tools, Lucent tools. Okay, um, other tools, other analysis tools, like I just mentioned, Trace Labs has a whole like package of OSINT tools that are pretty good. I recently did a CTF with them, so they were on my mind. Anyways, there are so many more that I could add, but you know, that would get this more into a training. Nobody came here for a training, so I'm gonna move on. And now that your analyst has all the data, they have the tools, they have everything, we're good to go. What's the method? Like, what do we do next? What are your analysts doing next? What should they be doing next? Well, first you need to make sure that your analysts have a defined area of operation. They need to have a scope. That way, when they're trying to go through the analysis process, it's, you know, defined. They're, you know, easily to stay out of rabbit holes or they're not getting too big. Helps them uh, know what data is important and what data is supplemental. The information they might keep uh, that kind of comes from the scope of the assignment. Um, tickets are an easy way to know what information to keep. So if you're like using JIRA, an analyst can go in there and say, what was needed? Oh, yeah, that's needed. So this is what I have to give back, go back and forth. Um, if you're doing like research, you know, the information you keep might be a lot different. Um, and it'll be just information, you know, that pertains to that research. You know, what is important? Is it supplemental that, to the to this, is it actionable, you know, is it old? So depending on what you're doing will depend on that information that you keep. So where to put that information? Um, it, it depends, um, like I mentioned, if you have JIRA, you know, the information might be going into there and that might be your starting point. Um, if you're an analyst just going like I did and having to look in endpoint systems every morning, you know, I kind of come in with a plan in my mind. Okay, I'm going to go look at little level alerts. Okay, uh, I just read about this new intrusion. Okay, I just read about this new ransomware. So, you know, where do you start? It uh, is depending on your mission. And then what to do with that information, you know, can also be dependent on that, on that as well. Um, but like I mentioned, you can put information into things like Analyst Notebook, Multigo, uh, Visio. You can put them into things like OneNote, Excel, um, so it kind of depends on your mission and what you're needing to get back out. All right, so ways that this uh, information can be shared. Well, it can be shared like we're doing now in conferences. Um, it can be shared on instant response teams when things are going down. Um, it can be shared on things like JIRA. It can be shared on uh, SharePoint. So it depends on why you're sharing this information and who this uh, information needs to get back out to. Uh, blogs are a good way to give back to the community and put information out there for other analysts. Um, sometimes the data is being shared through creating rules for endpoint systems. So like after you've done all your research, you might have created a YAR signature and that's a way it can, you know, all this analysis can be shared. So really, again, goes back to that scope and what your assignment was. So that scope is very important. All right, so cyber intelligence, I'm pretty sure we're all aware, is not new. Um, the data, the analysts, the threats, they've always been there um, for a long period of time. Um, so, but it kind of seems like cyber threat intelligence is kind of a buzzword. It kind of feels like threat hunters is a buzzword. Threat hunting is a buzzword. And they're just kind of being thrown out there now. And, and a reason that might be is because before us little cyber intelligence and us little hunters, we were just in small circles. And we were just sharing the information, you know, between us. And nobody was really interested in, you know, this information. Uh, and then things like ransomware started, you know, making it to the main stage. You started hearing about ransomware in the news and local media. Uh, breaches were being, are starting to be talked about more. So things that are happening in the cybersecurity field are starting to get a little bit of light on the main stage. And because of that, now companies and organizations are like, oh, I guess this is an area we should put money into. Oh, I guess this is an area we should be thinking about 
you know, and now organizations and companies are trying to be proactive, which is good, right? Proactive, not reactive. Um, and so, yeah, so it's not new. Um, just no one was really paying attention to this bill before, you know, before the ransomware, before the breaches, before, especially COVID. I think COVID's really brought to light some of, you know, these bad intentions. All right. So kind of like I mentioned before, um, why should a company or organization care about their threat space? Like I mentioned, because the threats aren't new. <laughs> and it's probably, you know, the same reason you would care about crime rates and, you know, crime moving into a new area. Like you wouldn't just say, you know, put your finger on a map and move there. You're going to do some research about it. You're going to see what the area is like. You're going to try to get to know it better so you don't move in blindly. Well, hopefully you don't move in blindly. You know, um, every company, organization, and even people, we don't have the same type of threats. You know, a person can be extorted for one thing and a company extorted for another. Department of Energy is going to have different threats than Bank of America. A power company might have attacks focused on taking down, you know, a grid system. Or a hospital, you know, might have attacks targeted on locking up their system and demanding a ransom, you know. Understanding those threats are going to help that organization create a more tailored approach to their cybersecurity needs and, you know, help that company fill in their cyber intelligence gaps. And this is something that antivirus vendors and endpoint systems can't do alone. You need that intelligence to kind of fill that gap there. And hunters do that. A hunter is, you know, the gatherer of intelligence. <laughs> they are a weapon against past and future threats. All right. So these next couple of slides are getting into, you know, some learning tools that I have used in the past or still use. Um, and this is not sponsored. And it's not, again, an end all be all list. There's tons more stuff out there than this list I'm going to provide. This is just a short list in case somebody is trying to get their feet wet. So a YouTuber that I frequent is Malware for Hedgehog, for Hedgehogs. He's my go-to YouTuber for learning about, you know, reverse engineering things and malware analysis. And yeah, he's really smart. Oh, my mouse is not working. There we go. <laughs> uh, some books that I have around are Learn Malware Analysis, Practical Packet Analysis, and Red Team Field Manual. Um, I also have Blue Team Field Manual which kind of has a lot of stuff the red team one has, but a little bit more. Both are good. So these are some websites that I also frequent. Uh, the first one is Dieter Stevens. He creates tools and he blogs. Um, yeah, so it's a good site. You can get tools and blogs, and sometimes he blogs about his tools in case you need to know how to use them. The second one is Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. It's a nonprofit organization and they aim to help advance women in cybersecurity. I am in this organization and I sometimes volunteer my time to put on training for them. Um, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, they were really welcoming and inclusive and gave training and whatnot during a time like years ago when you know women were still kind of being shut out from the space. So I really, you know, lean back on them for, you know, getting me where I am. So definitely if you're a woman coming into uh, cybersecurity, check them out. All right. So we're going to get into Twitter peoples that I follow that can be a good source of intelligence or learning. Boop. The first person is a malware researcher who often tweets about hitting Cobra and other, you know, cool tidbits. I'm telling y'all, I really like hitting Cobra. <laughs> They're a lot of fun. Anyways, the second person is also a malware researcher. Um, she tweets about many topics that include malware. The third, oops, I double clicked again. Bad. The third person is a really kick-ass person. She's a cyber professional as well. Uh, she was my last she was my mentor last year at B-Sides. Uh, the fourth person, the fourth person is a Twitter account that tweets about cyber intel uh, 
topics. And this person is a cool she bat that tweets. I like the name, MZ bat. It's kind of cool, kind of nerdy. <laughs> Anyways, the fifth person um, or the last person is the YouTuber that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, he tweets about reverse engineering, malware analysis. He retweets a lot of like blogs and stuff that are put out there. Um, I find almost everything that he puts out pretty useful and relevant to, to our field, my field, this field. All right. And that was the talk. I want to thank everybody for coming, staying here on your Friday, your virtual Friday. Uh, yeah. All right. I think we have time for questions and whatnot. I am checking the questions. Oops, they are moving. They are popping. One second. How do you get hands-on experience? Um, so there are always uh, learning opportunities going on. You can, you know, I think Twitter is a really useful place, especially for this field. And that's kind of where I learn about events. But um, I know the Women's Society, <laughs> the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu that I mentioned, we put on events, we put on uh, training. You can also do things like, um, I know Over the Wire has like CTFs that are really good. Um, CTFs are a great way to kind of get yourself in that hacker mindset. Um, some CTFs have uh, reverse engineering and malware analysis involved. So you, there are some that, you know, have a whole bunch of different uh, aspects and not just penetration testing. So that's a great way to get some hands on too. Um, and if you go to uh, Malware for Hedgehogs, he puts out, you know, uh, he goes through, you know, malware, like taking it apart and analyzing it. So if you set up a lab, you can also kind of just go through those YouTubes with him as he's doing it. You can also, you know, do it yourself. And I think that was a lot, you know, a lot of what got me through my early days is just watching videos and just recreating it. I know some people create stuff and then take apart their own stuff, but um, yeah. Um, also, Trace Labs is good for uh, open source stuff like OSINT um, and whatnot. Um, you can find me on Twitter. It's malware if you have other questions. Does language play a role in threat hunting? Uh, yes and no. Um, obviously, uh, if you can understand a language, um, it'll help you understand maybe that region better. Um, but you don't necessarily need to know a foreign language to be in cyber threat intelligence or in hunting. Um, you know, if you want to sit in incident response and hunt through logs, you definitely don't need a foreign language. But knowing uh, maybe like Python and programming languages is a uh, definitely a plus. I would say programming languages are plus and then foreign languages are um, that. Um, if you want to be a researcher in in like the hunting cyber threat intelligence area, knowing a foreign language can help you if your area of operation speaks that language, but there are definitely resources out there where not knowing it doesn't hinder it, but it is an advantage if you do know it. All right, I am checking the questions again. All right, I think there is a small delay. Soft skill, hmm. 
being able to, like I mentioned, um, adapt to situations and admit that you don't know something and being able to go and learn that something you don't know is definitely a skill to have. Um, being able to use your resources. So like being able to like reach out to other people who might know something that you don't know is, you know, good. Like I think in this field, you know, sometimes people don't want to ask questions, but asking questions to other people is like very important and it helps get you out there. And the more sources I want to say you have, the, you know, easier things are for you to kind of move around and make more fluid in this field. Um, but definitely the ability to continue to learn, pushing yourself to pick up those things that you don't know is great. Uh, is there a big difference between being in threat intelligence and being a threat hunter? So I want to say they're almost depending on where you go, they're almost interchangeable, right? A hunter is somebody who is going out and collecting those things, right? You're tracking down the threats and you can't track down threats if you don't have the intelligence. You know, you have to be able to pivot and go off something and that something is the, you know, intelligence. It's that threat intelligence. So you might hear people use um, OSINT, threat intelligence, cyber intelligence and threat hunting. And sometimes we use those interchangeably. I'm not saying we should, <laughs> but sometimes we use those interchangeably. Um, but the act of hunting is once you have gathered that intelligence and then you're putting it into actionable intelligence. So you have to have, you have to have that intel to do the hunt. So they're kind of going together. To have one if you don't have the other. Sorry, looking for. Yes, um, you don't need a forensics background, but a forensics background can be one of those stepping stones into uh, threat hunting. Because when you're doing forensics, you're taking pieces up, apart, you're putting, you know, you're seeing how things work, how they're all connected to each other and you're, you know, doing that bigger picture. Um, so definitely, you know, understanding things like that um, can help you become a threat hunter. And I mean, you're already kind of a threat hunter if you're doing forensics, because you're like, what am I going to go look at? What am I looking for? You know, what would the bad guy do? So when you're going to forensics, you're already kind of in that set. Now you just have to add other pieces to it. Um, and depending on, you know, what your mission is, you might um, already be considered a hunter. So, yeah. Hopefully that wasn't confusing. I felt like maybe I made that more confusing. All right. What types of questions should be asking if you're using CT, CTI team as a resource. Um, I'm not sure. It all depends on what you're working with. Um, your cyber threat intelligence team can tell you about threat actors. They can tell you about malware. They can tell you about trends. They can tell you what's new, uh, what's going on and things. So your cyber threat intelligence team is going to be and should be in the know. And so you can really ask them just anything cyber related. And if they don't know, they'll probably be able to point you in the right direction. So they are a wealth of knowledge. Talk to them. They want to talk to you. Trust me. Once you get a it's our intelligence analyst talking, they'll, they'll keep, we'll keep going. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for the questions. Find me on Twitter if you have more. <laughs>